Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the your seminar today. We are very happy and lucky to have Giovanni Toffo today. Uh, here, there we go. Also for the, for the audience on Zoom. Giovanni is, uh, has just submitted his PhD thesis at the University of Padova with Giorgio Pernacchioni about uh, uh, investigating deep seated earthquakes with a combination between field work uh, targeting uh, exhumed seismogenic faults, uh, integrated with numerical modeling and uh, microstructural studies. He has also benefited of uh, using a uh, uh, excite uh, to access infrastructures here in Oslo and uh, and analyze his samples. So Giovanni is at the moment uh, uh, is waiting to defend his thesis. Uh, will happen in July, July. I think. Yes. And uh, so this will be a good opportunity for him to to sum up the key results of his work. And uh, without further ado, the stage is yours. Yeah. Okay. So first of all, thank you, Luca, for the introduction and. Uh, also for proposing me to give this talk here, because you know I've been following these seminars for a couple of years, so it's pretty cool to be here today to present my work. And as you can read from the title, I'm going to talk to you about earthquakes, which is the topic of my thesis, and I'm going to present you basically two thirds of my research. So let's start with a quick introduction on the earthquakes. So earthquakes in the continental crust typically nucleate at the greater tactile transition, so at the bottom of the upper crust. You can see it here where, sorry, where we have the higher differential stresses, so at the conjunction between the brittle uh, failure criteria and the grid flow rows for core. But earthquakes can nucleate also at greater depths, so instead of the 10 to 15 kilometers of the brittle tactile transition, and nucleate also in the middle and lower crust. Here I just show you an example of earthquakes nucleating in the Indian uh, lithosphere at an undertrusting uh, Tibet. And these deep earthquakes have been associated with uh, the presence of dry rocks, dry granulitic rocks, that can sustain uh, high differential stresses. But earthquakes can occur also at greater depth than this. For example, if we move to the subducting oceanic lithosphere, we can see that hypocenters can, uh, that, that earthquakes can take place from the, the surface down to the 660 kilometers of depth. So at the transition between the, the upper and the lower mantle. Yeah, we have a chart of the, the frequency of hypocenters. And yeah, you can see that we can have earthquakes all the way down to 660 kilometers. Now, as you can imagine, it's physically not possible to probe directly a fault during an earthquake at this depth. So most of the information about earthquakes that we have comes from the interpretation of seismic waves. But there is also another approach, which is the study of exhumed fault rocks, and in particular, the study of fault rocks being pseudotactyl. Pseudotactyl, like this one, is uh, basically a transit picture map that is produced along a fault in silicatic rocks. And here, for example, we have a beautiful example of a fault of a fault vein with an injection vein filled with melt that the pass from it. The study of pseudotacylates and their host rocks can provide uh, fundamental information to understand earthquake mechanics because in pseudotacylates we can have a frozen in time a record of an earthquake. And in particular, if you want to study deep sea the pseudotachylate, if you can study deep sea the pseudotachylate, we are able to understand the mechanics of earthquakes below the brittle tactile transition, so in the middle and lower crust. And if you are lucky enough to find pseudotachylate from uh, oceanic subducted plates, we can study uh, mechanics of earthquakes also from this setting. So, what I want to show you today are the two examples of how the study of pseudotachylates. Can give us information about the mechanics of earthquakes. First, I will show you how, from the study of a single pseudotachylate, we can obtain uh, information about the energy budget of an earthquake, so the energy dissipated during a seismic event. And I will do it considering a middle continent, a middle cross that fault. And then, the second part of the talk. I will show you how we can obtain information from pseudotachylates and rocks being this pseudotachylate 
from so nothing for ceramic deposits, so from oxidized. And how we can put this information into a numerical model to test the uh, hypothesis on uh, the development of uh, vehicle failure under high confinement pressure. So now let's start from the third part of the talk. Uh, yeah, the title is On Cold Hyperic Energy Density Partitioning from Shock Garment in an Exhumed Seasonal Coastal Cold. So again, from a single pseudotacular vein, you can obtain a lot of information, from example, for example, about the propagation of the fracture, about the dynamic fracturing and frictional wear that is responsible then for the production of melt, and then uh, about the quenching stage. And all this information uh, can add to understand the mechanical effects, and we use this information to understand how energy is partitioned during an earthquake, because this feature here that I briefly summarized here are the direct effects of uh, the energy that is dissipated during activity failure. Because basically, an earthquake consists in the conversion of potential energy from, uh, from the world rocks, so potential energy, which is elastic strain energy and gravitational energy, that is converted into uh, radiated energy, so seismic waves. That account for up to 10 20 percent of the total energy dissipated during an earthquake, and the energy dissipated in the fault zone, so the energy dissipated along the fault in this lift. And this energy dissipated on the fault is composed of three main terms, which is the frictional heat that account for the largest part of the energy dissipated on the fault, the fracture energy, and then there is a, a third component. Which is the we call it elastic crystal plastic energy, which is basically the energy dissipated to strain the lattice of the minerals. And this component here is often cited in the literature, but no one has ever measured it so far. So the goal of this project was to measure this uh, crystal plastic energy. And to do it, we first of all we needed a, a single jerk pseudotactylate. Because we wanted to be sure that what we were measuring was the effect of a single earthquake. And we decided to, to we choose garnet as a target mineral because garnet is the mineral with the highest probability of preservation of lattice damage due to an earthquake because it has a, a very sluggish mobility of dislocation and, and yeah. It's basically because it has high fracture patterns. So it was the best choice. We selected a sample from uh, the Woodruff Trust in the Market Ranges, Central Australia, just to give you an, an idea of the geological setting. The Woodruff Trust that is highlighted here with two clippings here is a, a lithospheric scale structure with a, a, a myelinitized football and a strong hanging wall made of dry granulate. That host the largest volume of deep seated pseudotactylate in the world. So we selected a sample coming from, from this area, from, uh, from Mount Fraser. This is a, a, an overview of the place where we collected the sample. In red, it marked the Woodrow's path, so the interface between the smiling at the minoritized footwork and the pseudotactylate and the angling wall. And it's important to mention that at the angling wall, we have almost totally dry rocks, so they are really strong rocks. And the fact that these rocks are dry also prevent uh, reactions and uh, eventual overprints of the of the pseudotactylate during exhumation. So what we are studying is basically printing pseudotactylate. How are we going to measure this uh, this distortion in the lattice of the garnet? Well, we use HR EPSD, high angular resolution like a complex catalytic fraction. I did the analysis here last year. So this is why you saw me here last year. Yeah. And for those of you who are not familiar with the technique, basically we acquire a EPSD map with the high resolution patterns. We store the patterns. This is one of the EPSD patterns that we worked on. And then we cross correlate these patterns, portion of this pattern. To measure the relative uh, rotation and strains at the pixel size of this pattern. And in this way, we can 
quantify relative rotation and elastic strains of the lattice of the mineral. And from the elastic strains, we can obtain residual stresses, while from the from the rotations, we can obtain the densities of geometrically necessary rotation. So this is the technique that we use. And now let's take a look at the sample. This is a, a scan of the thin section with the pseudotactylate vein, the pod vein. It's a, a single pseudotactylate vein, it's pristine. The slight foliation that you can see here, it's a, it was produced during quenching, so it's not uh, overprinted by any tactile deformation. And this pseudotactylate cross cut uh, some pretty big garnets that, as you can see, are intensely fractured. Uh, as I said, the pseudotactylate is pristine, and you can see in this uh, backscattered uh, image here, we can appreciate the, the texture of the pseudotactylate that is still the, the quenching texture with the cauliflower garnets that uh, uh, increase in size from the, the, from the surfaces of the pseudotactylate to the middle. Here we have a detail of a cauliflower. And we have also some other microlites like cinnamonite and chiron. So we we're pretty sure that this pseudotactylate was, was, was produced approximately at this condition in according also with other observation from the area. Now, the garnet was the target. So let's take a look at the microstructures of the garnet. Garnet was uh, intensely pulverized toward the pseudotactylate with a, a grain size that was down to 20 nanometers, maybe less. We measured down to 20 nanometers. There were cataclastic portions locally close to the pseudotactylate. And along this cataclastic portion and along the fractures, there was a small enrichment, the slightly enrichment in, uh, in manganese that kind of killed the, the, the microstructures. And uh, we interpret these structures as the result of hybridization during the propagation of the at the structure tip. So this is a, a detail of a garment that we investigated. This here is the portion of the cataclastic portion that I just showed you. And we collected five uh, HREPSD maps, four of them along a, a transect at increasing distance for the pseudotactylate, so here and here. And then a fifth map here in the cataclastic portion. I'm going to show you now the results of the HRUPSD maps. So first of all, the four maps along the transect. Here I am plotting the in-plane components of the residual stresses, sigma 1, 1, 1, 2, and 2, 2. And you can clearly see that increasing the distance, the residual stress decreases. We have a maximum of around 5.5 GPA of stress of residual stress in contact with the pseudotactylate that decreases in less than a millimeter down to 0 0.8 GPA. Then here we it gets a bit higher again, but this can be other, other effects. And here I'm presenting instead the density of geometrically necessary dislocations. And again, you can see that the highest density of GMD is close to the pseudotactylate. Now, I want you to focus on the graph on the bottom left corner. This is the restricted second moment of the, uh, for the stress, probability of the stress. And it was, it has been shown experimentally that this, uh, uh, if this curve follow a straight line, it means that the higher stresses are related with the presence of dislocation. And it seems pretty obvious, as you can see, that higher stresses more or less correspond to the higher density of dislocation. Now, the fifth map, the one in the cataclastic domain, uh, I subdivided it between uh, low manganese grain and high manganese, the white grains. And what we can see is that in the low manganese grains, the stress are still pretty high. They're almost on the same range of values of uh, the map in contact with the pseudotactylate. And the same is for the geometrically necessary dislocation. So basically, in the cataclysm and in contact with the pseudotactylate, we have extremely high stresses and high geometrically necessary dislocation. So probably we are looking at the same process. Now, 
we measured uh, residual stresses and strains. We measured geometrically necessary dislocation. So we can calculate the crystal plastic energy that I mentioned before. And the crystal plastic energy is calculated this way. It is the sum of the strain energy, so the product of uh, stresses and strains, plus the energy stored at the core of the dislocation, which is the product of uh, the density of dislocation, uh, shear modulus, and value factors. Here, I show you the crystal plastic energy for the first three maps along the transit. And these values reported here are the average value per map. And they are expressed in joule over per, uh, cubic meters. But the energy budget is uh, uh, presented in joule per square meter. So we, we need to, to, to convert this unit because we want to know the amount of energy that is released per uh, sleeping square meter of the, of the pole. So we tried considering the, the whole gradient and we obtained uh, integrating the, the values on, along this transect of less than a millimeter, we obtained a value of 1.5 to 2.4 times 10 to the third joule per square meter. And this is clearly an underestimate because increasing the distance from the pseudotacular we are also uh, decreasing the the amount of uh, of stress that is uh, imposed to the ostracus, so the deformation. But then we consider that the highest value that we measure in contact with the pseudotacular can be considered as the uh, minimum energy that was uh, uh, that the the rock underwent. During the propagation of the of the of the rupture, and that is now uh, obliterated by by melting. So basically, we integrated this value over the thickness of the pseudotacular, that is three millimeters, and we ended up with a a value of twenty kilojoule per square meter as a as crystal plastic energy. Now to put this value in context, we quantified also the structural energy. Factor energy was basically the energy required to, to produce the structures, so the new surface and to propagate the seismic rupture. And it was quantified here by measuring the grain size distribution of this cataclastic portion. We did it with the EDSD, and for the finer grain parts, we used the high resolution back scattered imaging. And uh, we ended up with a range of test size that goes from 0 0.02 to 20 micrometers and a fractal uh, distribution coefficient of 2.1. And in this way, we estimated the fractal energy of uh, 10 to 300 uh, kilojoules per square meter, which is basically one order of magnitude greater than what we measured for crystal plastic energy. And then we measured also the heat produced during seismic sleep. We measured it considering that the heat is the energy consumed during the rock heating, melting, and further heating of the, of the melt. And so we considered this formulation here, considering the latent heat of melting of the phases uh, present in the pseudotaculite and the specific heats. We considered a uh, Ostrov temperature of 500 degrees, as I said before, and a maximum temperature of 1450 degrees, which is consistent with what we observe in the pseudotactic, because we have melting of, uh, of clouds of haze, but we still have some crust of quartz. So, temperature wasn't high enough to melt or support. With some image analysis, we quantified the abundance of, uh, of minerals in the pseudotactic. We have 61% of clouds of haze, 27% of biotype, and 12% of carbon. And over the volume of pseudotacular, we have around 20% of class. So applying to this, this formulation here, we obtain a value of uh, 13 megajoules per square meter. Now, if we want to put in context all these values, we can see that the heat is almost three order of magnitudes higher than the crystal plastic energy, while the factor energy is one order of magnitude greater than the crystal plastic energy. And we can compare these results with another study, Peter Heller 2008, 
where they quantified only friction and fracture, and we are almost on the same order of magnitude. So yeah, we believe that our results are pretty consistent. And this is the first time that the crystal plastic energy is quantified from a the, the first time that is quantified. And another important message that we want to share with this work is that the crystal plastic damage that is produced in this fracture can be uh, preserved in the ostro and can be preserved also completely if we have mirrors like garnet that don't uh, allow for annealing or other processes that can obliterate the record of crystal plastic damage. And this is it for the first part of the presentation. Now it's time to go a bit deeper in the lithosphere. We are moving from the middle trap to the subtracted oceanic plate. And I'm going to show you how we can quake our subtracting by slab at intermediate depth conditions. And this study is based on some observation of pseudotacylates from opulates that gives us uh, the parameters and the information that we needed to propose a, a new model for the buildup of high differential stress in the lithosphere that was validated with a numerical approach. Yeah. So brief introduction on the subducting uh, seismicity, in particular on the intermediate depth seismicity, which is seismicity taking place approximately between 70 and 300 kilometers per. As you can see, the number of events decreased exponentially, increasing increasing depth. And here in this cartoon, you can see that hypocenters define a double plane of seismicity that tend to merge toward the 20 kilometers more or less. And these two planes of, uh, of seismicity are characterized by down deep extension and down deep compression. Now, there are several models that try to explain the occurrence of earthquakes at this depth range. I'm going to show you the three main models now. And wait, uh, this is just a, a slide to show you how the distribution of hypocenters in different subduction zones is more or less consistent, showing this double plane of seismicity. And about the model, the first model that I'm going to cite is the degradation embrittlement that basically suggests that in response to the degradation of antigorite and other hydrated minerals during subduction, there can be a overpressure of the fluids that can lead to embrittlement and then a bit of failure of the rock. And this model is based on the uh, occurrence of uh, degradation of the main hydrated minerals of a subducting slab corresponding more or less with the distribution of hypocenters. Another model, always considering the degradation of uh, integrate, is the degradation driven stress transfer that in this case works also for only uh, also for a limited portion of integrate. And basically it predicts that in response to the degradation of serpentinite, you can have a increase of stress in the load being peridotype that can underwent a uh, seismic failure. And it was proved experimentally. Then, in contrast to these two models, there is the thermal runaway model that predicts a positive feedback between uh, viscous shear heating and uh, thermal softening. So basically, at a certain point, a rock that is performing viscously will uh, ab uh, abruptly accelerate and, uh, and fail, producing a CO2. And this model works in absence also of a free fluid phase. So it was proposed for the lower plane of seismicity where there should not be any, any hydrated minerals. Now, these three models have been validated numerically or experimentally, but actually they lack of a clear field evidence. So this is why uh, we decided to do this model. We were inspired by this work from Scambelluri et al, from Kine et al, where we did this, they described uh, three streams of the veins developed at uh, equilibrate fastest conditions in uh, peridotite and gabbros that were subducted during the final rodent and then uh, 
exhumed. And they were echolocyte fossils because they found uh, echolocyte fossils mineral, mineral assemblages in the pseudotachylite. And these pseudotachylites are particularly interesting because they've been preserved during exhumation because they were dry. You can see here in this uh, uh, photo of the thin section that this is a pseudotachylite vein. And you can see that it's completely black in cross polars because it's basically made of glass. So it's not really finger. And the microlites are still perfectly preserved in the pseudotachylite where it is crystallized. Yeah, for example, you can see some oil things. So the first important thing is that this pseudotachylite was produced at around 70 kilometers of depth in an ambient that was uh, properly dry. So we can basically rule out the hypothesis of uh, the iteration in Britain to explain this bizarre uh, Other observations from, from these rocks are that they still preserve the textures of the high temperature environment of the mantle and magmatic uh, environment. They are locally uh, pseudomorphosed by echolocyte fossil assemblages, but the texture is still the, the magmatic one. And there is no sign of tactile overprint over this texture. So the during the subduction and exhumation, the tactile deformation mechanisms weren't uh, efficient. Instead, these rocks are uh, intensely briefly deformed with slip planes, cataclasite, and pseudotachylates, of course. So, the second important message is that we don't have a, a viscous precursor over the seismic failure, so we can rule out also the thermal runaway model. Now, how we can explain the seismic failure of these rocks at 70 kilometers of depth, so an extremely high. Uh, pressure, confinement pressure condition without any embrittlement or softening uh, model. Well, we need extremely high differential pressures. And so uh, how can we build up this extremely high differential stresses? This is the main question of this work. We try to model the stresses during subduction of our understanding state. And we followed this approach. We did a, a numerical simulation with the finite difference method. We used a numerical code called LAMEM by the group of Boris Cows. We basically simulated free subduction. So our lab that is represented here sub, uh, was subducting only due to its weight, its contrast in, in viscosity, in uh, density between the stenosphere. We used a pretty high resolution of one kilometer in this area, so where subduction took place, to be sure to measure correctly the stresses in the subducting plate. We used a viscoelastoplastic rheology, so our model it can be both viscously, elastically, and plastically. And we considered two sets of uh, viscous behaviors. The first set of model was only with dislocation and diffusion grip. And the second sets of model considered also bioscape, which makes it more reasonable, more realistic. And we tested, what is important, the effect of inclusions that were spread in the first 40 kilometers of this lab here. Inclusion that had different uh, logical parameters, so different shear modulus and different viscosity. And we wanted to see if this uh, inclusion were able to amplify the stress up to simultaneous values. These inclusions were in the in the sorry, in this part of the slab from the beginning, but we activated them so we changed the logical parameters only once the the slab was basically partially flattened on the on the bottom of the of the model. So when subduction was stable in our simulations. Now I'll show you some of the results. First of all, here you can see that. The slab is bending here, then bending. This is what I call a stable configuration of the subduction. This is the overpressure, and as you can see, in red we have extension, in blue we have compression, and this perfectly matches the focal mechanisms that I cited before. So down deep extension and down deep compression for the high centers of this range of depth. And another important thing is that. The stress region is bounded 
by the 800 degree isotherm, which more or less corresponds to the brittle lactide transition for olivine at these 10 years. Now, if we take a look at the second environment of distress, you can see that without low temperature plasticity, so in the model with only dislocation and diffusion fit, we can reach up to 800, 900 MPA stress. While if we consider low temperature plasticity, stress are, are much uh, are much smaller and hardly reach uh, half of GPA. So this value of stress are too low for a brittle failure of 70 kilometers of depth. So now let's see what happens if we put some inclusions. Before seeing the results of the inclusion in the slab, it's easier to take a look at the single inclusion. So a simplified model. We have this uh, uh, linear viscous system, the viscoelastic system. The blue material has a shear modulus of 100 GPA, which is the value that we used for, for our simulation for the plan. And a viscosity linear or linear viscosity of 10 to the 20 kPa seconds. And we put it under compression and we change the values of uh, of these inclusions. And if we take a look at the bottom uh, left, the bottom right corner, bottom right graph, you, we can see that maintaining the same shear model, the same viscosity in the inclusion, but decreasing the shear modulus, at the increasing strain, we can have an increase of uh, the stress surrounding the inclusion. So we have an amplification of the stress around this circular inclusion. Then if we decrease the shear modulus, but we decrease also the viscosity inside the, the inclusion, we can see that the amplification of stress is less efficient. And at very low viscosity, it's almost not efficient at all. So the inclusion to work as a stress amplifier need to have low shear modulus, but still a relatively high viscosity. Now, here you have the results of the simulation, and just showing you two cases. We did several with different, with different abundances of inclusions. And as you can see here in the first case, without low temperature plasticity, after 10 time steps, which is more or less uh, between 10,000 and 3,000 years in the simulation, we can reach uh, a degradation stress of more than 4 GPA in this region here, so at intermediate depth conditions, which is extremely high. And actually, this value can be even higher if we let the simulation run for longer. And this is just because uh, dislocation creep and diffusion creep are not active in this region. And so the stress build up elastically continuously until the of failure. Now, if we consider this set of models here with low temperature plasticity, so more realistic models, we can see that after 10 time steps here, we can reach about 1.2 GPA, which is a pretty high value, but still not high enough to explain uh, intermediate depth seismicity by simply a uh, high differential stress. If we let the simulation run for longer anyway, we can reach higher values. And we also observe that higher values are achieved if we consider for example, uh, strain hardening and the effect of pressure on the formulation of low temperature plasticity. Because low temperature plasticity was calibrated experimentally, but it's a pretty difficult deformation mechanism to, to obtain experimentally and to calibrate a flow load from experiments. So there are several uh, differences in the various flow load uh, available in the literature. Anyway, we show that with the presence of inclusions, we can have high differential stresses that can uh, be responsible for earthquakes. But what can this uh, inclusion be? Well, serpentinite, for example, have a very low shear modulus, 20 to 20 GPA, which is comparable to what we use in our simulation, but also have a very low viscosity. We are talking about 10 to the 19 Pascal second, which is too low to produce the amplification effect that we showed. However, if we consider it a partially serpentinized peridotite, as it can be, for example, in slightly hydrated slabs, we can have still uh, very small shear modulus, but 
a higher viscosity. And this is, for example, compatible with what we observe in the rocks from Mancuni, where the viscous deformation of, uh, of the rocks is not active, but still we can have a bit of vibration and a slight disorientation locally, preserving the original texture of the oceanic environment. And we have that hydration that can produce this partially surfetinized peridotite take place mainly along bending folds. And this fits pretty well with the distribution of earthquakes in various subduction zones where we have a correlation between hydration along, along the bending folds and the abundance of earthquakes. So, in conclusion, we can say that this partially hydrated or partially serpentinized peridotite in a, surrounded by a dry load bearing peridotite can behave as local stress amplifiers. Now, I mentioned uh, low temperature plasticity, and I want to show you here just a few of the low temperature plasticity flow loads for olivine and how they can shift towards higher stresses, for example, considering spray hardening here, the red dash line, or considering the effect of pressure here to the So basically, if the low temperature plasticity is really affected by strain hardening and by pressure, we can have high differential stresses even at greater depths. And so, yeah, this is to sum up the conclusion. Serpentinized so peridotite can behave as local stress amplifiers, and the low temperature plasticity of volume is the mechanisms that limit brittle failure approximately below 100 km per second. And yeah, this is the conclusion of my talk. I showed you how we can obtain information about our mechanics from pseudopaculate. And now I'm happy to take any 